um, video I posted for concluding Midsummer Night's Dream on Monday. So we're starting Hamlet. How many of you have read Hamlet before? Anybody? Okay. Um, I'm trying to think how to start this. Hamlet's not an easy play to read. Let me rephrase that. In one sense, it is easy, but Hamlet is one of those works, and, and you've probably read something like this before, where each time you read it, it just opens up more and more. It's like an onion. You just continually peel the layers back. I've been teaching this for 30 years. Every time I read it, there's something else. There's a, a little nuance okay, that Shakespeare puts into two things. That Shakespeare puts into the play, but also because every one of us, if we read something twice, we're not the same person when we read it the second time. If any amount of time goes by between one reading of something and the second reading of something, you've changed in that amount of time. You've had experiences that you hadn't had the first time. You read whatever that piece of literature is. And so that affects in some way, might be very small, it might be huge, um, how the work works on you. So if you open your book to the introduction on 1237 in the 11th edition talks a little bit about you know the background of the play the plot etc mentions that it's a revenge tragedy revenge tragedies were kind of all the rage in elizabethan england um late 1580s early 1590s they were they were kind of dying down by the time shakespeare writes hamlet Produced and first performed in 1600. Um, I mean, that's actually a few years after it was really in vogue, revenge tragedy. And you've got a couple other revenge tragedies mentioned at the bottom of the page on 1237. Basic characteristic of a revenge tragedy is when the play begins, somebody has already been killed. Usually that's the case. Somebody has already been killed, and when the play opens, a relative, a family member of the dead person is told in one way or another that the person who died was killed because it may not be obvious that the person was killed. For example, Hamlet. Everybody thinks Hamlet Sr. died of natural causes bitten by a snake or something like that when he took a rest in his garden, took a nap in his garden. It will be revealed to Hamlet, no, he didn't die of natural causes. He was murdered by his brother. That is kind of typically what happens. Somebody, you know, the surviving family member gets told and therefore the charges laid on that person get revenge. Or, um, Get vengeance for, for my death, right? And the rest of the play is generally about how the person gets that vengeance. What, what steps he or she takes to perform that act. Now, Shakespeare throws a wrinkle into the revenge tragedy genre by raising some pretty important questions, okay? General kind of overview here. Shakespeare's portrayal of the society that Hamlet lives in is that it's Christian, first of all. Okay, the, the ancient revenge tragedies by Seneca, a Spanish author, um, Roman author you've mentioned in your introduction, obviously Christianity wasn't a, an issue. Okay, so the religious aspect wasn't as important, except to the extent that we saw, for example, like in Oedipus the King and Antigone, Okay? where, you know, there are laws of the gods, and those laws should be upheld and things like that. Shakespeare brings the issue of Christianity in. Why? Well, both in Shakespeare's day and in kind of general the history, 
traditional history of Christianity from its beginning to Shakespeare's day and even you know within some branches to today, suicide is not an option. It's, you know, in many branches, it's the unforgivable sin because you can't repent of it. You can't repent for something you're going to do, all right? That in itself is an issue that we'll have to talk about a little bit later on. But also murder is not generally looked upon. Or vengeance, why? Because the Old Testament says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And Jesus teaches his followers, turn the other cheek, don't get vengeance, you know, the whole nine yards. And here you have a guy who's told, your father was murdered by your uncle, kill your uncle. So Hamlet is immediately put into a quandary. How do I kill my uncle and still save my own soul, preserve my own soul, okay? But there's another question. When Hamlet talks to the ghost, the ghost tells him all this kind of stuff. Hamlet raises another issue. How do I know the ghost is telling the truth? How do I know you're a ghost and not a demon? Pretending to be my dead father and trying to entice me to hell. So that's why Hamlet has to come up with various plot devices for the purposes of the play to try to figure out the veracity of what the ghost is saying. Okay? Um, one of the things about Hamlet's character, Hamlet, Hamlet is referred to, sheesh, <laughs> in almost every presidential election. Okay? And he's referred to often in light of, didn't you tell me that you don't have a, you do now. Um, he's referred to in light of someone who has not announced that he or she is going to run for the office of president, but someone who a lot of people think should announce. And the way it's always described is this person is Hamlet-like, sitting on the fence, can't decide what to do. Okay. Does that describe, you may not have finished the play, you weren't required to, but one of the things I want you to consider is, does that describe, adequately describe or portray Hamlet's character? Is it really what Hamlet is like? Um, in the 10th edition, it's on pages 1602 to 26, the first act. Okay. Or is it that Hamlet is seeking more proof? Is Hamlet just kind of, you know, wishy-washy? He can't make up his mind, ultimately is the question. Okay, so turn to the actual play. Begins on page 1238 in the 11th edition, 1602 in the um, 10th edition. And we get our list of dramatis personae, all right? We have Claudius, king of Denmark. Notice he doesn't have a German name. He has a Roman name, okay? We have Hamlet, son to the late and nephew to the present king. Polonius, Lord Chamberlain. Horatio, friend to Hamlet. Laertes, son to Polonius. Notice all the names except for Hamlet are Roman. And that's probably because, I'm not saying that it definitely is, I don't know for sure, but it's probably because it's a revenge tragedy and most revenge tragedies are set in Rome. But this is a Germanic one because the character Hamlet goes back to an older Germanic tale about a guy named Ambleth, A-M-B-L-E-T-H. It's not in your introduction, okay? And so you have a variety of courtiers and such. Voltamont, Cornelius, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern. You got a gentleman, a priest, you have a couple of officers. They're going to turn out to be friends of Hamlet's, etc. You have um, 
Two clowns, grave diggers, they're not clowns. <coughs> Why are they called clowns? Because they're kind of stupid. They're not the brightest bulbs in the box, okay? To, to refer to them as clowns is kind of derogatory. They're grave diggers. That is, they work with their hands and they ditch, they dig ditches. That's another, you know, putting down that skill, so to speak, all right? The you know, Fortinbras Prince of Norway, who doesn't show up until the very last scene of the play, the captain, and then some women mentioned, Gertrude, Queen of Denmark, Hamlet's mother, okay, Ophelia, daughter to Polonius, and then a variety of lords and ladies. We get the setting. Scene one, Elsinore. Elsinore is a town or a place in Denmark. Some have said that it's the name of the castle. It's not quite sure, okay? And the scene is a platform, some kind of raised space before the castle, okay? It's on the battlement. So if you, you know, look at a normal castle, you have the crenellated wall, which is you know, the thing that looks like this. So they're walking back and forth on this kind of thing. You stand here and shoot arrows, you jump behind here and hide behind, you know, let the arrows hit the wall. And we have two characters in her, Bernardo and Francisco. They're sentinels. What's a sentinel? It's another word for sentinel. Guard. Night watch, okay? They're standing guard for some reason. It's going to be said fairly soon, they're not exactly sure why, okay? So, the play opens with a question that's important. Who's there? Francisco, nay, answer me, stand and unfold yourself. They don't enter simultaneously. They don't enter necessarily, if you were thinking of the globe, okay, so you have your stage like this, the globe comes around, and you got door one, door two, tiring house back here. They don't enter through one door. One comes out this door, one comes out this door. And it's as if they can't see each other, they can hear each other though. Right? So, who's there? They hear a noise. Each one kind of does that. Who's there? Answer me. Long live the king. That's kind of like code. It's cool. I'm one of you. Bernardo, he, you come most carefully upon your hour. In other words, it's Bernardo's time to take over the watch and Francisco's time to leave. Tis now struck twelve. Get thee to bed, Francisco. He says, oh, thanks, it's cold, all right? Quiet guard, that is, you didn't see anything, was there any problems, not a mouse stirring. If you meet Horatio Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, bid them make haste. And you've got a gloss down there, you know, partners, they're supposed to be there with him, so he's there by himself now once Francisco leaves, okay? He says, I think I hear them. They come in, Francisco leaves, so now we have Marcellus, Bernardo, and Horatio on the battlement. And Marcellus asks, line 21, has this thing happened, excuse me, has this thing appeared again tonight? So, play begins. Who's there? Okay. What kind of question is that? It's, it's seeking the identity of something. That is, it knows there's something there, but isn't sure what. So how do, you, how do you get the answer to it? Not only necessarily from the other person responding, but what do you have to do if you're on guard? Go check it out, okay? How? I'm, I'm talking literally. That, I'm not talking, you know, up here some super duper deep answer. You gotta open your eyes. You gotta be looking, you have to be watching. 
you have to be observing okay, these three words. Has this thing appeared again tonight? Notice, not has this person, not has that group, this thing. The thing isn't defined. I have seen nothing. Horatio says, tis but our fantasy. Okay, so our fantasy, what's that telling us? Marcellus and Bernardo, whatever this thing is, they've both seen it. Horatio hasn't seen it. Okay. What does it mean when it says, Horatio says, tis but our fantasy? It's their imaginations. If you watched the, the lecture for the last act of Midsummer Night's Dream, they're sitting around after the wedding, okay, and or just before the ceremony, either one of the two. And Theseus, Hippolyta, Demetrius, and Helena, Lysander, and Hermia are talking, okay, and they're talking about what the lovers experienced in the wood. And Hippolyta is like, something strange is going on there. And Theseus you know, goes on into this little speech. I think it's one of the most beautiful in, in Shakespeare. And he talks about what the imagination can do. Right? He says the imagination can take a bush to be a bear. You can't see it clearly. It's dark. You might hear a rustling. And your mind goes to, it's something dangerous. Or a cloak over a chair can suddenly, in the middle of the night, you wake up, you're drowsy, it can look like a person kind of a thing. Okay? Hippolyta's response to that is, yeah, but they all saw and experienced the exact same thing. Explain that one. It's okay if one person dreams. But if four people dream the exact same thing, uh, there's a little more to there. In, in Theseus talks about imagination and substance in dreams, etc. We're going to see a very similar emphasis on dreams, substance, in reality, in Hamlet. Okay? Tis but our fantasy means it's our imaginations playing tricks with us. Okay? Have you ever been in a situation, Middle Tennessee has lots of fog. Have you ever been in a situation, you know, where the fog is literally swirling? Okay. Sometimes that fog, when it swirls, can look like it takes on a shape. That's probably what Horatio thinks happened. So, Horatio says, "'Tis but our fantasy, and will not let belief take hold of him touching this dreaded sight, meaning he doesn't believe us. Remember what the misfit said was his big problem? Why he was the misfit? Because he wasn't there to see if Jesus really did the things that are said that Jesus did. If he was there, he would know. Why? Because he would have seen him with his own two eyes. Okay? Horatio wasn't there when Bernardo and Marcellus saw this thing before. That's why he won't let belief take hold of him. We have a, fr a phrase, a saying. Seeing is believing. And notice, they've seen it twice now. Therefore, I have entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night, that is, and that's why Horatio is here. It's appeared to them twice before, and it's implied one was last night, and the first was the night before. So they're assuming it's going to happen again this night. Okay? Horatio will not appear. Why does Horatio think it will not appear? Because it's not real. 
and Horatio of mine. Reality versus appearance is a huge theme throughout all of Shakespeare. That is, sometimes things can seem to be, but they're not. And he's really interested with those things that seem to be, as well as things that really are. And how sometimes the things that really are don't appear how we think they should. Okay? So, Bernardo says, let's sit down and talk. Let us refresh for your ears what it is we've seen. Okay? So, Bernardo starts. And he says, last night, that same star that you see right now. The bell then beating one. So, they get there right around midnight. And apparently now, a long time has passed for somehow with very little dialogue. And the clock is now almost one, and the ghost enters. Notice how Bernardo sets it up for us. Peace, break the off. Look where it comes again. In the same figure, like the king that's it. It doesn't just appear as this, you know, lacking shape, glowing orb kind of thing. It looks like the dead king. In fact, we're going to be told it looks how like the dead king. Dead king in his night clothes, his pajamas. No, the dead king armed what's called kappa P, head to toe, P-I-E-D, foot, okay? Looks a lot, not, looks a not like the king market, Horatio. Okay, now notice that. Doesn't it not, does it not look like the king? What's the key word there? Like. Like, you use like when you make a simile. Something is like something else. What does that literally mean? It isn't that other thing. And when you use a metaphor, you say, that boy's a pig. A simile, that boy eats like a pig. You're still making a comparison. But with a metaphor, you're identifying the thing with the other thing. With a simile, you're just saying it's similar to. All right? In the same figure, like the king that's dead. Thou art a scholar. Speak to it, Horatio. It looks not like the king. Mark it. Mark means look, watch, note. Most like it. He says, yes, it does look like the king. Why am I harping on like? Because they don't know yet if it is the king. Right? Because anybody could put on a costume. And where is it? Somewhere in the New Testament, I believe it is in First or Second Peter, where Peter says that Satan goes around like an angel of light, trying to entice, trying to deceive. Most like it, it harrows me with fear and wonder. You've got a gloss down there for harrows, lacerates the feelings. It's kind of a ridiculous gloss. What does it mean to lacerate the feelings? It scares the living daylights out of them. That's what harrows me. Nearly scares him to death. Bernardo, it would be spoke to. It wants to be spoken to. Okay? Speak to it, Horatio. So Horatio does. What art thou that usurps this time of night? Together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of Barry Denmark did sometimes march. By heaven I charge thee. Okay, a couple of things there. What does he mean, usurps this time of night? What does it mean to usurp something? Louder? Yeah. If, if, if Kamala Harris today were to say, 
We're going to come out with a news conference and say the most of the, um, half of Joe Biden's cabinet has determined that he is incompetent and unable to produce, you know, to fulfill the requirements for the presidency. I therefore am acting president. Okay. That wouldn't quote unquote pass constitutional muster. There has to be a certain percentage, and I believe it's more than half of the cabinet, has got to sign off on that. It's 25th Amendment that deals with presidential incapacitation. She would be guilty of usurping the presidency. The usurping is taking the position of wrongly. Okay, So Horatio says this image, whatever this thing is, has taken the night away in one sense. That is, is appearing in the night when it shouldn't. What are they assuming about the thing? It doesn't belong here. What are they assuming the thing is? Again, because it's just an assumption at this point. They're assuming it's a ghost. Where do ghosts belong? What are ghosts? Dead people, disembodied souls. Where do disembodied souls belong? Not wandering around up here. They belong where, wherever the dead are. Whatever what happens to one when one is dead. You know, if you're talking about in the Christian sense, you could see, say either heaven or hell. Or in the Catholic Christian sense, purgatory is also an option. Okay? which is going to be brought up in the play. I should mention up at the outset. This is Shakespeare's most religious play. By far. But it's not just a throw out an altar call, come down and accept Jesus kind of a most religious play. There's contrasting religious views. There's Protestantism and there's Catholicism. And they're at loggerheads. And they're at loggerheads when Shakespeare is writing this. Not as strongly as 10 years previous, okay, or 20 years previous, or 30 years previous. The whole reign of Queen Elizabeth, there's this huge tension between the Protestant church and the Catholic church. To the extent, depending on which side you're on, you know, during Elizabeth's reign, got so bad, she was stringing up and killing Catholics. Her sister, Mary, when she was queen, was stringing up and killing Protestants. She's the one from whom we get the name of the drink, the Bloody Mary. Okay? So, a lot of religious, you know, religion was, was worth dying over in this period. So, you usurp this time of night together with that fair in warlike form. Notice, the time of night is being usurped and the form, the appearance of the dead king Hamlet. So what Horatio is really asking is, what are you that look like dead Hamlet? Are you dead Hamlet or are you something else? Speak. I charge thee by heaven, calling down an oath to God. I command you, okay? It doesn't speak. It is offended. How do we know? Look at the stage direction. And the stage direction is given via dialogue. It is offended. See? <laughs> it's walking away. That's how we know it's offended. <clears throat> the ghost leaves. Okay, Horatio, now what do you think? How now, Horatio? You tremble and look pale. See, he wouldn't tremble and look pale if this was merely a fantasy, if this was merely his imagination. Is not this thing something more than fantasy? What think you on it? Pause for a second. Turn in your books back to Act 
Theseus' speech, Act 5, Scene 1, in Midsummer Night's Dream. <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> I don't usually do this, but I think it's important to do it. So, Hippolyta. Tis strange what these lovers speak of. Strange means out of the ordinary, un unexplicable. I can't you know, wrap my mind around it. This is page 1225. And Theseus says, more strange than true. In other words, they were hallucinating. More strange than true means it's false. There's no reality to what they actually are describing. And so he says, I never may believe these antique fables, nor these fairy toys. Antique fables, old myths, okay, or fairy toys. These fairy stories, you've got a gloss down there. Lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies, that apprehend more than cruel reason ever comprehends. Okay? Lovers and madmen. Notice he puts them in the same group. So crazy people and people in love. People in love are crazy people. They do what? Their brains seethe. It means their brains are boiling in their minds. What happens if you get a high temperature? What's the highest temperature you've ever had? Sometime when I was seven or eight, second or third grade, I missed like three weeks of school. Had really bad flu. This was in 1968 when Hong Kong flu hit the United States. And I reached a temperature of like 105. That's pretty high. You get much higher than that, they put you in an ice bath, okay? And, you know, wild dreams, just out of this world. Why? Because your brain is cooking when it gets that high. So he goes on. They have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies. Their imaginations give shape to what's going on up here that apprehend their fantasies apprehend take hold of literally that's what apprehend me means more than cool reason comprehends that is they create images up here that cool reason logic what doesn't understand They see things that can't be explained. Like, just reading an article this morning, former Navy pilot talking about the unidentified aerial phenomena. And he was like, I guys in my squadron, we saw these things with our two eyes. We were out on a flight, one plane was here, one plane was here, and one of these things came right up between us. Little like black box in a sphere, a clear sphere. We're flying, you know, F-16s don't fly 100, 200 miles an hour. They generally go 350 and higher. And this thing whoosh, came right up between us, stood still, and it took off at Mach 1, 700 miles per hour. No idea what it is, okay? more than cool reason ever comprehends. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet. Oh, so now he adds another. The poet. Or of imagination all compact. That is, they're all made out of the same thing. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet. Okay? One sees devils. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That's the madman. The lover, all is frantic, sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt. Helen's beauty, Helen, the wife of Paris, of Greece, okay? Uh, excuse me, the wife of Menelaus of Greece, who was kidnapped by Paris of Troy, and whose beauty was such that one poet described it as the face that launched a thousand ships, okay? So one, the lover sees her beauty in a brow of Egypt. 
with the brow of Egypt, someone with a dark complexion, a not white person. In Shakespeare's day, whiteness, and I don't mean like you and I, for those of you who are white, I mean white like paper white, okay, was the ideal of beauty. So the lover sees beauty where? In the opposite of that. That's how crazy that person is. The poet's eye, in a fine frenzy rolling, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven, and as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shape and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. What does he mean with that long sentence? The poet sees things in his mind. The poet... The, the literary creator doesn't just mean poet. The fiction writer does what? Sees things in his mind and takes a pen and does what? Why? Why does every poet, every literary creator, put fingers to keyboard or pen to paper? Where does what they see exist up here, right? Where do they want it also to exist? In here, and in here, and in here. Because once you read that, where does Hamlet come to be? Where does Hamlet come to life? In your minds. Not just in Shakespeare's anymore. And that's why we still read. Shakespeare today. It's why we still read Oedipus today. Because those characters now live up here. Notice, turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothing. Because does an idea have solidity? No. Gives a local habitation and a name. Scene one, Athens. Scene one, Elsinore on a platform before the castle. Shakespeare begins one of his most famous plays, Henry V, with a guy who comes out and delivers a prologue. And he says, imagine that this wooden O, meaning the Globe Theater, is the fields of France. And so he's putting the people's minds on the fields of France just before the Battle of Agincourt in the Hundred Years' War. He's setting them, so to speak. Okay? Such tricks has such strong, has strong ima imagination that if it would but apprehend some joy, the imagination, if the imagination would apprehend, would reach out and grab some joy, is joy... A physical thing. No, it's not. Then it does what? It comprehends some bringer of that joy. The imagination, Shakespeare is saying, if it reaches hold of something, then it goes one more step. And it says, guess what? If I can imagine that thing, then there has to be something that created that thing in the first place. <clears throat> Where do ideas come from? Is it merely an electrochemical reaction in the mind? Why did J.K. Rowling one morning on a train trip from Manchester to London have popped into her mind a boy who discovers on his 11th birthday that his parents were killed by the greatest dark wizard who ever lived, and that dark wizard is after him. When literally one second before that, she had no idea of that. And it, it's there. Why did you, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien, one morning grading entrance exams to Oxford, turn over a page on a blue book. I've held this in my hands. Turn over a page on a blue book and write on a blank page in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. And he had no idea what the hell a hobbit was. It's just like, 
And then he wakes up. And then he has to figure out what the hell's a hobbit. And he starts to write a story that he starts to tell his children. And they're like, Dad, this is great. <laughs> and he starts reading it to his friends. And they tell him, you got to publish it. And he publishes it and becomes internationally famous. Why? Where did the idea for Hobbit come from? That's what Shakespeare's getting at in that passage. Where do these ideas come from? Great film, by the way. What Dreams May Come kind of deals with this issue. Where do dreams come from? Hamlet's going to ask that question. Okay, back to Hamlet. So, um, Bernardo, is not this something more than fantasy? It's not just something in our minds. Okay? What think you on it, Horatio? Before my God, that is, I swear to God, I might not disbelieve without the sensible, that is, sensory perception. Another issue I should put up here. It's hard to write with this thing. That's an S and an I, and that's an E. Epistemology. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy that deals with how we know what we know. Well, the number one way we know what we know is empiricism. We can determine it with our senses. How do I know this table, this thing is hard? Because that hurts, actually. And if I keep doing that, I'm going to get a bruise. So, physical reality, our senses. What does he say? I might not disbelieve, I wouldn't believe this, were it not for the sensible and true about of mine own eyes. He's saying, my eyes, my eyes aren't deceiving me. I really saw it. Is it not like the king? Okay. Meaning what? Similar to, but not the king himself. Look at Horatio's reply. As thou art to thyself. Think about that. Is the thing we saw not like the dead king? Horatio's reply. It is like the dead king as you are like to yourself. How are you like to yourself? Or how are you to yourself? You are yourself, right? There's no like there. There's no comparison there. You are you. What's Horatio saying? This isn't like the dead king. This is the dead king. This is real. Okay? And he didn't usurp the fair form in warlike majesty of the dead king. This is the fair form in warlike majesty of the dead king. Such was the very armor he had on when he, the ambitious Norway, combated. That is, when he fought against... Shakespeare uses the names of the countries to stand in for the king. Norway, Denmark means king of Norway, king of Denmark. All right? So frowned he once when in an angry parl he smote the slanted poleaxe on the ice. That is, Horatio was saying... I was there. I, I know what he looked like. Marcellus, twice before this happened, and at this very hour. So Horatio says, in what, in what particular thought to work, I know not, but in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. Why? The dead don't normally go walking around. He's saying, this isn't good. This does not bode well for us. Okay? Marcellus then gets to the question that the who's there prompts. Why are we out here? 
Why are we keeping sentinel? Why are we keeping watch at night? And the implication is by asking the question, he's saying, we're at peace with everybody. What, what gives? Horatio. Oh, I can tell you that. And he gives a long speech about why they're at watch. Okay. The young Fortinbra of Norway, the dead king of Norway's son, is on the warpath, to use a Native American metaphor. Why? Because he has to prove himself. He has to prove he's warlike. He has to make it so that people will respect him. He's in a similar situation to Hamlet. His uncle is king. Okay? Temporarily, at least. So, he goes on and says, we're out here because, you know, current king is kind of afraid Norway might march on us and such. So, Bernardo says, you know, I think you're right. I think that probably is it. Well, may it sort that this portentous figure comes armed through our watch. So like the king that was and is the question of these wars, that is, the, what you're saying, Horatio, makes sense because that would give cause for the dead king kind of to rise and warn us. That's the portentous figure, you know. Horatio, a moat it is to trouble the mind's eye. What is a moat? It's a speck of dust. What happens when you get a speck of dust or a piece of sawdust? I've had this happen far too many times. In your eye. What do you start to do? You do this. And your eye gets redder and redder and inflamed until that little speck of dust gets out. Okay, But that's a physical speck of dust in the physical eye. He's saying, this is what? This is like an intellectual piece of dust that gets stuck in the mind. How does an oyster make pearls? A grain of sand. A single grain of sand. And it produces this secretion that goes, builds around the pearl and builds and builds and builds and builds and builds until you have a pearl, various sized. Okay? The mind will do what with this speck of dust? Have you ever had anything that just drives you crazy? You can't get the thought out of your mind? Happens to me all the time. I'll be teaching, and I'll forget a name. And it'll come up eight hours later. I'll be doing something totally different, and it's like, damn it, there it is. Okay. And he goes on and talks about Julius Caesar. When Julius Caesar fell, what's today? March 15th, the Ides of March. It's the day Julius Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC. Okay? 44, yeah, I think that's right. And he talks about how the graves open and blah, blah, blah. The ghost comes back in. Okay? Horatio goes, charges it again. The ghost spreads its arms. He charges it again, commands it to speak. Okay. And notice he says, if there be any good thing to be done that may to thee do ease and grace to me, speak. If I can do anything that brings ease to you, in other words, that lets you requiescent in pacum, rest in peace, because the belief system is, if a soul is wandering the world, why is it wandering the world? Unfinished business. Something it has left undone, and it can't be at peace until that's done. Okay? And notice, bring grace to me. What's grace? That is an overflowing or an abundance that, of God that is given to the individual. It can be a variety of, you know, peace, etc. If thou, it doesn't speak. If thou art privy to that country's fate, which happily for knowing may avoid, speak. He gives the fourth option. 
Or if thou hast uphoarded in thy life extorted treasure in the womb of earth, for which they say, you spirits off walked in death, speak. Why? Why the very last option? Why would he say, if you have buried treasure, speak? Because the idea was, if that treasure is unburied and distributed, given to the poor, that will erase that hoarding of it during life. It'll be turning a sin into a virtue, a vice into a virtue, okay? So it leaves again. Cock crows, disappears for the final time. Horatio, they go on and talk about it. Horatio says, I've heard it said that you know, before the morning comes, ghosts have got to go back to, you know, etc. He mentions our Savior's birth and such. Okay? So Horatio says, ending of the speech or of the scene, let me tell Hamlet. Tomorrow night, we'll keep watch again. Hamlet will be here. Maybe it will speak to Hamlet. Okay? Scene two. We don't have time to go into it much. But scene two. A room of state in the castle. Now what does that mean, a room of state? Highly decorated. Ornately furnished. Okay? This is where you welcome ambassadors and kings and queens and such. I mean, you pull out all the stops, all right? And so Claudius comes in with Gertrude, the queen, various counselors, etc., etc., and Claudius gets a big, long speech. What, 38 lines or so? Though yet of Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green, telling us what about the amount of time that's passed since Hamlet Sr.'s death? Not long. And that it us be fitted to bear our hearts in grief and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe. Meaning, and we did the proper rites of mourning and the entire kingdom mourn. I don't know if you watched any of it, but you still can. When Queen Elizabeth died last September, Britain pulled out all the stops. Why? It's the first monarch's death in over 70 years. And if there's one thing the Brits know how to do, it's pageantry. It's, you know, following all the little, you know, rules of protocol and such. He says, yet. Yet always implies what? But. There's going to be a contradiction that's going to come up. So far hath discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think on him together with remembrance of ourselves. That is, we think sorrowfully on Hamlet, but we have to remember we're not dead. We keep going. We'll stop there. Right? But what he's going to draw it onto, the very next part of the speech is, and I'm going to marry his wife. Or, I have married his wife. His wife being what to Claudius? Sister-in-law. Within this tradition, big no-no. That's incest. Okay? Okay, we'll stop there. Um, check your email later today. I haven't decided yet. I might put up I probably will put up a quiz that will cover like the last half of Midsummer Night's Dream since I haven't done that.